We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine. That's Emily. Um, and I would like everyone to know that there is a giant swarm of bees hanging out outside my cabin. Yikes. Are you okay? Yes, the bees are downstairs and away, um, but it is a quite large swarm, and it's bees. That's terrifying. I'm so afraid of bees, like very, very afraid of bees. So best of luck to you. Yeah, they're 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 not my favorite, but um, I mean it, it's cool to look at the way that like they, they all kind of like gather together in in one you know, mound of bee. Um, but yeah, I, I would like that mound of bee to not be downstairs outside my room, to be quite honest. Okay, okay Sebastian Vettel, <laughs> let's, let's work on your bee problem. Yes, um, I like bees. I just don't want them in my space. Oh, totally agree. Yeah, no, not not a fan. Well, it sounds like you're off to a great summer camp start. You know, good for you. <laughs> yeah. No, but but speaking of of summer camp, I have um one of my my sweet mates. She also likes Formula One. Um, and we were sitting on opposite sides of the dining hall toward for like the last you know ten to fifteen laps of the race. And we'll get into how awesome the race was. Um, but every time something wild would happen, I would like grab my iPad off the table, run across the dining hall, show her what was happening. I did that with like when Perez crashed out and like the back of his car um, was just hanging off by a thread. And when Carlos spun off um, and then I would like run back to my seat and then something crazy would happen and pick up the iPad and run back over to her, um, which I think was a little bit better than me you know, yelling across the dining hall. Carlos Sainz screwed up and he's out of the race and Ferrari's double DNFing. Hey, no. We don't use those words when it comes to Ferrari. We don't curse them with the double I mean, DNF. we kind of have to. We kind of oh. have to. I wish you would have yelled across the dining hall. I feel like that would have been more entertaining. <laughs> yes, but then I probably would have gotten yelled at. <laughs> fair, fair. Oh, gosh. My, my well. desk is so loud. <laughs> It's okay at the table I'm using. That, so I'm in an Airbnb right now. I'm, I think we said that in our predictions podcast. But um, it is literally the worst place I've ever lived. It smells so terrible. The internet is absolute shite. And the table that I'm currently using is not, like, one of the legs is significantly shorter than the other. So I'm, like, shoving a sandal underneath it so it, like, doesn't rick it back and forth. The chairs are broken. It's It's just, like disgusting the oven and stove don't work there's one spoon and i'm sleeping in a twin bed that's probably smaller than your camp bed so that's look into my glamorous life of living abroad <laughs> go team yeah well if you're watching this on youtube you will see behind me my bed is now no longer six feet off the ground so you know, but the, when before we recorded our predictions episode, I had slept on the mattress on the floor because I just could not handle making my bed seven feet up in the air. So I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to be on the floor. I'm going to sleep on the floor until the staff are able to unlock the bed, which fortunately they were able to do quickly. And they also put the mattress back on the bed without me asking, which I thought was really great. And the people that were that are hosting us this summer are like really great and we're really happy so far. Um, but yeah, I just could not. Well, I didn't even recognize your room because it had the big bed back there last time. So I didn't even realize. I thought you were somewhere else recording. So yay <laughs> yeah no it, it's it's a wonder what the the bed when it's not seven feet up in the air can can do for for the aesthetics of the room oh <laughs> uh, well i think that's enough catching up of, of our lives and how our summers are starting but we should probably get into some of the off-track happenings before we cover canada so first thing that made me like really chuckle but also kind of cringe because I'm borderline worried about a curse um Zach Brown got Miami mm -hmm. tattooed for Orlando so similar to what he did for Danny when he won uh in Monza Monza thank I knew one of the Italian Monza's 
Monza, Monza, Monza. Yes. Um, so similar to that, he got a tattoo. Super great. However, if we think back to what happened when Danny got his uh, race tattooed on Zach, um, he didn't have a great season after that. So a little worried about Lando, but Lando drove really, really well today. And I think McLaren's, you know, on an upward trajectory. So hopefully everything's just fine. I kind of want him just to like have to get so many because Lando just keeps winning. So his whole arm is just like yeah. covered. <laughs> Love it. Oh, a- absolutely. I, I, I think that I, 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 the first thing I did think of was, oh, what if this like starts some sort of like McLaren curse because of what happened to Daniel? Um, but I, I don't think we're going to see that. I think that, um, you know, if, if, McLaren doesn't have the same issues that they had today with the safety car and some suspect strategy, um, then it could have been even more competitive than what it already was as a race. Yeah. Ugh, I know that stupid safety car. Anyways, before we get there, um, also something super exciting that I think we all kind of knew was coming. Um, Yuki Tsunoda is staying at VCARB, so he will remain a Red Bull you know, JV driver for one more year, bringing him through the end of the 2025 season. Um, I know we've spoke about it several times on this podcast and Catherine's like a huge champion of this, of Honda's moving to Aston Martin in 2026. And it seems super likely that Yuki will also move with Honda to Aston Martin in 2026. Yeah, I just, I I really think that based off, you know, like Helmet Marco's comments about, you know, Yuki, like I really don't know how much he likes Yuki um, as anything more than just like a, a junior Red Bull driver. And, and as we have said multiple times, I really think that the only place that Yuki is going to see any success you know, on the grid is, you know, is, is not going to be in, in the, the main Red Bull team. And I think that the best opportunity would be Aston or Martin. And also this does put some writing on the wall of like, well, Fernando's already confirmed through 26. So what's going to happen to Lance? Bye bye. Yes, that. Yeah. So it'll, I think it'll be super interesting, um, you know, loving this all season long, silly season, just, just 2024. Silly season. That is what I'm calling this year. But super excited for Yuki. Glad he'll stay on the grid. We are huge champions of him. We think he's doing great this season. So I'm happy that he gets to to stay there. And he's doing great things and like maybe not the best car. So I really just want to see him in a better car. 100%. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Agreed. Next on my agenda. So... Again, I'm a huge fan of drivers doing alternates. Like, the alternate liveries are really fun if done well, a la not Ferrari. Um, And I love the special helmets. And I will say, most of the time, I don't love Daniel Ricciardo's helmets. Like, I don't know what it is, but the design is just, like, never my Mm -hmm. favorite. Until this weekend, when he had pancakes and maple syrup spilling down his helmet. Holy shit, who thought of this? I approve. I'm obsessed. Yeah, I I think we have a new contender for helmet of the year up there with Alex Albon's panda helmet from China. Like this, it, it's just, it's such a great helmet. It has all of the like honey badger elements while also being very Canada-fied, um, but in a really fun way that isn't just putting a bunch of like maple leaves on a helmet for Canada. So I thought it was, it was a really great helmet. Um, Conversely, I was actually really surprised at how little they had to say about Lance Stroll's helmet, which was a, a little, it yeah. was black and gold, had some, it was like, I think probably something related to his, the Tim Horton sponsorship that he had been doing um, throughout the week. Um, but you, I, I would think that they would, you know, reference it more, but I only really noticed it. I, I don't even know, maybe this morning at the beginning of the race um, when I was like, that's a black and gold helmet. That's not the helmet he usually wears. And I mean, it looked fine, but I, I thought that that, you know, Lance maybe could have done a little more. Yeah, it was a snooze. Like, I'm expecting more from him. It's his home race. Do more, Lance. Do more. <laughs> Please. Yeah. 
And Pierre Gasly also had a custom helmet from some rapper and producer Nav. And the helmet actually did look pretty cool. I only knew, but I only knew that because I Googled Canadian Grand Prix 2024 helmets <laughs> and there was an article that came up for it. Um, but yeah, so I, it was, it was very interesting that like sometimes everybody makes a big splash and we have like the Daniel Ricardo um, syrup and pancakes video. And then sometimes it's like, oh yeah, we kind of mentioned it, but like didn't even put it up on Instagram. So I thought that that was just really interesting. Yeah. And like, again, with the Lance thing, I just, I would expect so much more from him. And I feel like they didn't do a lot to mm -hmm. show that he had a special helmet either. Um, but I just, whoever came up with this idea for Daniel Ricardo, I feel like it sits so much in his lane too, about like something oh, playful yeah. and fun. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan. This, I think the Panda and the Maple Syrup so far are my top two helmets of the year. Oh, agreed. They're, they were, they're phenomenal. And I, I cannot wait to see what more we get out of the, you know, the helmets throughout the rest of the season. So we can really see what is going to be like our, you know, actual top, like top five, top 10 contenders. Cause I think it's going to be a really great battle that we're going to have for like you and me at the end of the season. Yeah. I'm still like holding hope and holding space for Lando to have a really good helmet because I feel like yes. Lando always has really good ones. His Senna one was really cool, but I feel like we can get more from him and we still have a long ways to go. Yeah, like I, I really want like a beach ball or a, a basketball like he's had, you know, in Miami the last couple of years. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking for something like that out of, of Lando. And right, we do have, I think, what, 15 more races at this point. So um, yeah. there's still time. Definitely, definitely. Well, that's all I had for off track happenings. I kind of want to get into this race because we're back to good racing. And we needed that because Mon Monaco and Imola back to back were just so tough to watch. And like, this is the race that like, I'm glad that I am surrounded by people who are like, oh, Catherine likes this motorsport stuff. This is kind of interesting. What is she watching? And it's not like a downer of a, like the Monaco parade. Like this is something really exciting that I was losing my shit about um, while everyone like what's going on with Catherine which is you know that's kind of normal um but I mean this race had everything it had DNFs it had safety cars it had dumb Ferrari's tire strategy on not just a Ferrari team it had drivers crashing to each other and spins and a false start that wasn't and Alpine even had double points and K-Mags was running in P4 at one point like this had everything lions and tigers and bears oh my it was super action-packed and even quality this weekend, too, was kind of out of the norm. Like, we had people knocked out way earlier than they should have been. You know, Checo, mm -hmm. what you doing, buddy? <laughs> I think it's like Yuki, oh my God. I think Yuki and Daniel have out-qualified Checo in the last, like, three races. Um, which is, you know, comical and ironic since he just got the Red Bull seat and the other two were trying for the Red Bull seat. But yeah, it had a lot of action. I I mean, we kind of knew going in with the chance of weather, we were going to get a crazy race. Now, did I expect five DNFs? No, but nope. I think it was super competitive. And the, you know, the safety cars always throw a wrench into strategy and change things up. Um but I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. And I was like not sitting there snoozing. I was like actually watching. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, even the fact that like Max did Max things again and won his 60th F1 race, like it wasn't just Max driving off into the sunset to win. Like he had to execute some really good strategy, take advantage on some very suspect McLaren gambles um, and, and really like he had to he had to work for it but not the same way he had to work for it in Imola like Imola was like clinging to a victory and yeah. I really feel like you know Canada was you know fighting really hard for a victory driving a really smart race um you know he had one little bit where he 
you know, drove off onto the grass. And I think he also had to, um, he, he had to outrun a groundhog at one point dur- during the race. They didn't show on the broadcast. Um, but I thought it was, it was a really, really solid race for Max. And if we are going to have a more competitive grid, I, you know, at, not even just as a Red Bull fan, but as somebody who's a fan of really good racing, I don't just want to see everybody else getting competitive and Max struggling, um, you know, as a, you know, sort of like, ha ha karma, your time is up, you know, let's have him be as competitive as everybody else on the grid and have everybody fighting for it at the top. Yeah. And I think that's what we were talking about while we were watching the race. Like, it's just so nice to see a competitive race at, in every aspect of the, of the term, because we had competition from P1 down to P15 and it's not like, oh, Max is off. And then you know, we have three people fighting for the other two podium spots and then like nothing's going on. Um, There was, there was fighting and overtake. Alex Albon had a double overtake to get into the points. Like, are you kidding me? That was such a good move. And there was, there was just fights everywhere and overtaking and competition. And I think this year versus last year, everyone is starting to progress more. And I think evidence of that and that being clear is Alpine getting, you know, double doubling in points when we didn't even think that they would get points all season. Yeah. And, and another thing that I, I, I think that I, that I like that we see now that I don't necessarily think that we've seen a lot in the, in the past, especially in, you know, going back to the era of Mercedes dominance is, and obviously, you know, Checo needs to get his, his shit together. Um, but this wasn't just, not only was this not red, you know, Max driving off into the sunset, but this wasn't, you know, Red Bull driving off into the sunset the same way that we used to saw, see Mercedes with Lewis and Botas driving off yeah. into the sunset. Set. This was that. This was them. You know, this was a bunch of different drivers. Um, the, my sweet mates are back. Um, th- these are noises that you will hear throughout the summer. Um, but it, we had a bunch of different um, uh, drivers competing for you know these top spots and just competing everywhere. And like you said, like comp- competition everywhere, which is so great to see. Yeah, hundred percent. But yeah, so we kind of covered like Max doing his Max things, um, but also someone else who is kind of just hitting their stride is Lando, and I'm so so happy. I mean, he did finally win his first race in Miami, um, but this is his fourth podium in five races, which is awesome. I mean, yeah. this time last season, I think they were still really really struggling. Um, we all remember his you know six pit stop the first race of 2023. So I think versus last year, they're really making strides. McLaren is really doing well. Um, He did get screwed a little bit, I think, on the safety car. And I want to, again, I know it's like it happened. It is what it is. But I just want to go back a little bit in time. And like if he was able to pit right away under the safety car, I want to know how much how much closer it would have been between him and Max. Oh, I, I definitely agree. I really think that McLaren's strategy really went to the school of suspect Ferrari strategy, not just after the first safety car when Max was able to take the lead, but also after the second safety car. I I really think that they they gambled on a strategy, and you know, obviously, you you know, you know, there are, are times to to gamble, and I just really don't think that those times were the times for McLaren to gamble on, you know, what Lando was doing and based on what Max was doing, because Max wasn't struggling like he was in some of the other races where Max and Lando have battled. Um, so I was I'm, I I was really wondering what McLaren was thinking, because and because otherwise Lando drove a great race yeah I mean I think it's a damned if you do damned if you if you don't like every strategy situation you put yourself in like sometimes you're setting up for a safety car anticipating a safety car then one doesn't come and you shoot yourself in the foot or you like go for Mm -hmm. one thing based on other what other teams are doing trying to react and react anticipate undercut all those things. Like, I don't know if everyone gets their strategy a hundred percent perfect. Like even when Max wins, I don't know if their strategy goes completely according to plan. So do I think that they didn't necessarily make the right risks and Lando ended up in P2? Maybe, but 
I still think it worked well enough to put them, you know, two cars in the top four spots. Top yeah, five. yeah, yeah. Top you're five, you're sorry, definitely top not five. wrong there. I I think that the um the first pit stop. Um, I was also, you know, doing camp things, so I wasn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't watch as closely, but I think it was the, the first pit stop after the safety car where I really think that they shouldn't have done what they did do. The second one, um, you know, that, that gamble, I, you know, once they were, you know, transitioning to slicks, I think that was, that was a little bit more fair, but I still think it was a little suspect. Yeah, that's fair. Fair assessment. Again, it's so much easier to sit here and judge it than being the ones actually making the decisions, so... Of course, of course. Um, And then, like, unfortunately, we have to talk about one of my least favorite people, which is uh, George Russell. Potentially landed himself on the podium as of now, as of recording at 9.30 p.m. Argentina time. Um, George Russell still holds P3, but he did get summoned to the stewards, and he may lose P3. We're not sure. But he just complained the entire time, and he was yeah, annoying. Yeah, um, I know. I think I think he had one of, as George Russell does. He had one of the best radio calls of the year when he he went on and said, "I think it slicks in twenty <laughs> minutes," and his engineer said, "No, George, it's going to rain in twenty minutes." I lost it laughing and like could not explain the context to the people around me um, about why that's funny. Um, but at the same time, even if George does lose that position. Who's inheriting P3? Lewis. So it's staying in at Mercedes. Um, but I really do think like George, obviously George was disappointed to lose from pole, which he should talk to Charles because Charles is used to it. Um, but he he really looked like the kind of guy who knew that he was at a high risk of losing his podium while he was celebrating on that podium. And honestly, I just love that if he loses his podium, it goes to Lewis Hamilton, his teammate. Yeah. Oh. Anyways, my never-ending, you know, yeah. grudge and fight with George Russell. So it, this makes me laugh. But um, before we go to who else impressed, I did want to make a point on the podium. The uh, and sorry, the the delay between our Wi Fi's is not that wonderful, and hopefully that will be remedied soon. Um, but I loved the Pirelli winner, the Pirelli podium hats. They were white and red for Canada, and I just thought that they looked really, really cool. Like the black and gold is always awesome because that's like that's Pirelli. But I was like, oh, that's a nice white. Pirelli hat. So I don't know when Pirelli started doing these like specialty help, um, hats, but I feel like this is, this was, Canada did not have like an alternative Pirelli hat for the podium last year, but I know, I, I don't know, it was one of the ones in the Middle East, I think had a different like hat last year. Um, but I like how they're kind of doing different ones and they're having, you know, variations of it. It's kind of fun. I like it. All for it. Yeah, it's 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 really it's really cool. I I, I really enjoy it. Um, speaking of things that we enjoy, obviously we talked about how much we enjoy Danny Ricardo's um, helmet for Canada, um, but he also had a pretty good weekend. Um, obviously, the the kind of the biggest you know drama news was Jack Villeneuve, who's a former F one champion, um, had joined Sky Sports for the weekend and was basically saying, "Why is Danny Ricardo still driving in Formula One?" Obviously, you know. The thing is, is like Danny is, is driving good enough to still stay in Formula One. Like there are so many other drivers on the grid that you could say, well, why is he still in driving in Formula One? Um, but I, I wasn't able to listen to a lot of the coverage, um, just because I'm, I'm in staff training all week. Um, but I have not seen a lot of positive um, response to Jacques Villeneuve's um, commentary. I know that uh, Danny Ricardo told him to eat shit um, in, in one of the interviews in the, in the media pen. Um, but I don't think that his presence on the broadcast really resonated with the audience. No, I think this was a miss. And I don't think he'll be invited back next year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, and I think we were talking about it all weekend that Danny was really you know, driving with a purpose, had a great weekend, qualified really well. Um, I think he started really slow, which did not help him. I mean, everyone started really, really slow, but I think he, you know, lost places right away, but then he was able to hold out for P8 and get some points, which 
he hasn't gotten points since the sprint in Miami, so it's nice to see him back up in the points. Yeah. Um, I'm really happy for him. Yeah, I did. I did just want to also mention the the false start penalty that he got, and um, you know they were they were talking about the the false start, and you know they showed on the replay what it was, and comparing it to Lando Norris's false start, I didn't really like many other people. I didn't really see what Danny did, um, so I thought that was a little suspect. And fortunately, he was still able to hold on to the points. He he took advantage of the the safety cars that um, came after. After he served his penalty, I, he served during during the first safety car. Um, but I, I do I do think that that was uh, race, race control did did not really you know do justice to to that um, that review. Um, but he did hold on to points, and that was really helpful, especially since Yuki um, did not score points. Um, yeah, after having a very good race, you know, at, at the end there, there was a little bit of an incident, um, but. I think my favorite part is Danny Ricardo has finally moved Ollie Behrman out of P12 in the driver's standings because Ollie Behrman, who has not scored a point since Saudi Arabia, is has been in P12 for weeks. And now Danny is in P12. He has nine points. And um, I think Ollie still has six, which he's tied with Nico Hulkenberg still, um, which I just think is hilarious. I'm dead. Uh his response to the Ferraris being knocked out in Q2 was like every single Ferrari fan on the planet. I'm like, I'm so glad that you yeah. too like don't understand it. Just it it made me it made me chuckle. Oh, but um, so, yeah, Ferrari looked rough all weekend. Yeah, they did. It was not a good weekend, and. We don't need to talk about it anymore. But, you know, on the, on the flip side, on the flip side, um, a team that we used to, you know, really rag on, still kind of do, um, they got double points. So Alpine did end up in double points. And Esty Bestie drove like a madman, and he went from P20 to P10, which is insane. Yeah, I I didn't even realize like I forgot because you know, it's so easy to st- not think about Alpine because Alpine, you know, unless is Alpine Esty Besty <laughs> and and Gasly are fighting each other, um, there's really not much to talk about with Alpine. Um, but Acon, um, he qualified P18. He had a three a five place grid penalty after Monaco, so that put him back to P20, um, and somehow managed to finish P10. Like. I don't even know how that happened because there were so many things happening throughout that race. I know how it happened because five people DNF'd. So that automatically moves them up. (laughs) So he didn't have to work too hard. Um, But no, it was, it was still a good drive, you know, good clean drive for him. Um, And Gasly got points as well. Again, Alpine is so easy to forget. I constantly don't know where they are, especially Gasly. Um, but every single time there was a crash, I'm like, it has to be the Alpines. Like, where are the Alpines? Are the Alpines okay? And surprisingly, they were all day. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's something that we, we don't, we're not really used to seeing. Um, and, you know, on it, like sergeant crashed twice if we want to be technical about this and you know Perez <sighs> lost the back end of his car like and you know honestly like you know I know we don't want to talk about Ferrari but Ferrari looked so poor all weekend and then you know th- their decision to put Charles Leclerc on slicks when they knew it was going to start to rain was just like absolute like he got overtaken not just by Max, but also by the top five drivers. And, you know, it, it like it, you and I in our dams were just like, when is he going to retire the car? Like, he has to just retire the car. Why is he still driving? Can we stop talking about this so I don't jump out of my window? Honestly, Please don't though, jump out of your like, window. Honestly, I don't hate this for Charles, but I hate it for Carlos. Um, Carlos is still trying to drive for a seat. Charles could literally do no wrong in the eyes of Ferrari. So, um, and I also did call that he was not going to have a good weekend. I just, I could sense it. My spidey senses, you did. senses were tingling. Uh, but no, it makes me sad for Carlos. And Carlos had just like such a freak accident at the end. Like just 
losing control a little bit going around the corner and then hitting Albon. So that's really unfortunate. Um, But yeah, I mean, but okay, you threw Ferrari at me, but I'm going to throw Checo at you because like, what is going on? He was out in Q1. please. And like, I forgot he was racing. And that's what... That's what uh, Martin was saying, too. He's like, honestly, I completely forgot that Checo was racing until he crashed. And then he was like, also, um, my man, that's not how DRS works. <laughs> and I was just, like, dying at that comment. Oh, it was so good. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, again, super yeah, like, forgettable. Yeah, no, Checo, like, Helmet Marco came out and said this week, which, you know, we, we know that Helmet has to be really careful when he's speaking about Sergio Perez because of last year's accidental racism oopsie. Um, but he said that Perez's issues are not issues with the car. They're psychological, which makes sense. It's so no typical shit. of Checo. He does this every year, and, and I'm so tired of it. Yeah, like, of course they're, you know, psychological, whatever. Like, Max is winning and Max is doing incredible things. You have the same car. How are you so far apart? Clearly, it's the driver. So, anyways. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, speaking of all of these good and bad things happening, it completely blew up all of our predictions. But let's go through them anyways, because it's fun to see how bad we did. So... For poll, <laughs> yes. you had Max, I had Lando. Uh, surprise, George got poll. Didn't have that one on my bingo card at all this year. Um, so nope. we did not get a point there. For podium, uh, you had we kind of had the same one. You had Max, Lando, Carlos. I had Lando, Max, Carlos. Um, yeah, so that also didn't happen. It was Max, Lando, Russell with an asterisk, maybe Lewis. We will see. Um, And then for P10, the last place where you get points. um, So we pick it because it's really impossible to pick. You had Fernando. I had Stroll. So we had the brothers, Aston Martin. uh, And neither of them got it. It was SD Besty like we talked about. So go us. Zero points for this weekend. Yay. Yep. Um, but we did do a little bit better on the categories where we don't award ourselves points. So for the biggest surprise, you said that Haas was going to have course. a clean weekend. Um, and surprise, K-Mags was running in P4 for a hot minute and both of the drivers finished. So I say you win. And then I said, we're going to have overtaking and a big change from the grid, like from start to finish. And I think I nailed that one as well. And we did. Yeah, I want to add uh, about K Mags. Is K Mags came into the weekend still complaining about Perez in Monaco from the crash that he Kevin Magnuson caused? And the like, I I saw that and I was just like, really, Kevin, you got so lucky that they decided not to review that inc- that incident. Like, stop talking and and stop like trying to tempt fate because you are still two points away from a race ban and it was your fault yeah i think he just needs to not talk about crashing because it's usually his fault yeah (laughs) yeah exactly okay and then our last prediction um we you know, say who's going to do a dumb. So it's the oops of the weekend. And you said Alpine. And for once in our lifetime, Alpine did not do a dumb. They got double points. No. Um, <laughs> which is okay. Um, but me, on the other hand, I nailed this. I said that Charles was going to come off of Monaco and just shit the bed. And I will say he shat the bed. <laughs> Ferrari didn't, you know, help his situation because they made it worse putting him on those slicks. But, um, but yeah, so Charles didn't have a good weekend. And I got that one too. Team. Yeah, when when they said, you know, how you know, how much time are, are am I losing on on the straights or or whatever he asked it, and they're like, so much. And then they finally came back and they're like half a second. I'm like, oh my God, 
that's so bad. And I also, I, I want to shout out real quick to um, P1 with Matt and Tommy, um, which is the, one of the podcasts that got me into to Formula One when they were still back at their original outfit um, on YouTube. I They, they put out a compilation um, because Matt is a big Ferrari, is a huge Ferrari and Charles fan. And they just had a compilation of like all of their, all of his reactions to everything that happened with Ferrari today. And it is just like their reaction and commentary is gold oh it is it's absolute gold it's so funny yeah i mean poor guy it was painful to watch and charles (laughs) well um it was really painful to watch ferrari struggle today but at the same time i was like i was kind of expecting this because everyone kept saying oh there's a chance that ferrari will you know overtake and leap red bull in the constructor standing and i'm like well it's probably gonna be a double dnf so (laughs) and then they didn't (laughs) yeah so oops but yeah those are our predictions for canada and how we did um i this race i know there was a lot of weather it rained a lot on and off but it was super exciting to watch and i think this like kind of rejuvenate rejuvenated me to get excited again for the season. Cause I feel like I was just kind of like lulling in Imola and Monaco. And now I'm like, we're racing. Like this is good, competitive, awesome racing. It was nice to see all of the upgrades that teams have been bringing for the past two races, like actually in motion. Um, Cause it's really hard to tell Imola or or Monaco. So it was really nice to see them like in action and um, see the, the competitiveness of the grid. So Absolutely. I, and, and not only that, but um, and I, knew, I, I have a note here. A number of teams did also bring more updates. <clears throat> I, where, where did I put that note? Um, did I put, oh yeah, Red Bull, Mercedes, Williams, RB, and Sauber all came with more upgrade packages for Canada. Um, and Aston Martin and Haas also came with smaller upgrade packages. And I think that you could really tell that these cars were, were upgraded. Obviously, Red Bull's initial Imola upgrades were kind of a downgrade. And I think that they're coming out of, you know, what struggles that they were going through in Imola and and, in Monaco. But I, I'm really glad that we had an exciting race because like this, like, this is what I enjoy about formula one. This is why I like this weird sport so much. Um, and I, it just, I'm glad that it was something that I was able to get excited about, you know, throughout the day and like, be like, look, this is something that's really cool that's happening. Even though I know you don't understand it to all the people that are around me. Yeah, no, I mean, as like big as Monaco is, and that's probably the race that most people who aren't F1 fans are going to watch, like, it's not a race to really, you know, grab and keep the new fan. But this is a race where it's more Mm -hmm. likely if they see it, they would grasp it and be like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to keep tuning in and keep watching. So, yeah. Yeah, I I even said to to somebody was like, wait, Formula One, that's Monaco, right? And I was like, yeah, Monaco was a few weeks ago, and it was awful. This race will (laughs) hopefully be better. Yes. And it was. It was. It was was much better. I was very happy. Everything everything went well in Canada. So, And I do like this race, and it's so beautiful, like right on the water. Like, it's, it's incredible. I really do like this, this race. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. We got a lot of good racing. We got a lot of excitement. The weather really helped make it, you know, it was it was just enough weather because obviously we've had weather races in, you know, Suzuka 2022 and Spa 2021. We're like, that's too much rain. Um, And like this was enough weather to make it challenging but not enough weather to make it like, you know, somebody's going to make a dumb comment about how a driver who almost, you know, got into a really messy, scary crash. It was his fault. And I'm still butthurt about that. (laughs) Well, with that subtlety. Suzuka uh, 22. (laughs) I know. Um, All right. Well, I have no other thoughts, feels, emotions, comments about Canada. I thought it was a great race. Um, and I'm excited to to continue yeah. on. We have Spain next, so we have an off week, and then we have Spain. Yes, yes, haha! For once, yes. Emily is right on yes. the calendar. Um, but yes, yeah, so on our off week, we are going to 
um, like we promised, come out with an F101 about the 2026 regulations. So doing a deep dive and, you know, layman's terms everything for, for the general fan. So that will be coming out sometime next week. But that has been our Canada Grand Prix recap episode. Thanks for going up track with us, guys.